My name is John, John Woodruff. I'm from Piers. I'm an Alameda County pool of consumer champions. And I am your happy and congenial moderator, which means Thank you. I do not tell jokes. I do not tell stories. All I do is introduce the panelists, turn it over to them, and share with you that each of them is going to do about 10, maybe 15 minutes of uh, talking about, uh, uh, about the topic. And the topic is faith-based programs that serve people with mental health disabilities. And then in between the topics, if you've got questions, of course they will take questions. And at the end, the hope is to have at least a half an hour for some discussion and inter interaction. So let me introduce the panelists. We have um, Esker, Esker D. Ling Ligon. Ligon. And um, Esker D. is the manager of behavioral health at Glide Health Services. And then after Esker D., Dr. Donald Tarver is the chief consulting psychiatrist at Glide Health Services. And then um, after Dr. Tarver, we're going to hear from Kathy O'Brien, who's a therapist. And then after Kathy, we're going to hear from Harry Williams, who's a lead case manager at Glide Training and Employment Services. And then um, uh, playing sweep will be Vicki Smith, who's a mental health nurse practitioner with Glide Health Services. So let me turn, it, turn, them, turn the panel over to Esker D. Good morning. So what I'd like to start off with is I'll give you a little bit of an overview of Glide Health Services, kind of the history of the clinic and the work that we actually do at the clinic and talk a little bit about the approach that we use in the clinic that seems like it's a bit unique and kind of ahead of the times as far as state initiatives, as far as integration of services. Um, and kind of using more of a holistic approach to services. Um, Glide Health Services began in 1997 as a collaboration between Glide Memorial Church and the University of California, San Francisco School of Nursing. Um, originally when the clinic opened, there was one nurse practitioner working four hours a week and she was kind of doing drop-in visits with people. But very quickly, she kind of found that there was a need for much more services than just one person could provide. It was also very apparent that many of the clients coming had more than just physical health concerns. Um, clients were homeless, underinsured, uninsured, struggling with substance use issues. Um, and um, the majority of our clients that we serve have some form of a mental health issue. Um, you know, the title of our presentation says serving people with mental health disabilities. We don't necessarily look at it as per se serving a bunch of disabled people from mental illness. Um, we like to take an approach that we're trying to help people to improve the quality of their lives and somehow empower them. Yes, you may have a mental health issue or mental health diagnosis, but we don't necessarily want to label you as being disabled as a result of that illness. And if it is to the point where it's so severely disabling, we want to work to find out what we can do to make you more productive in your life and have an improved quality of life. Um, where the clinic has grown now is we have, I believe, maybe 10 to 12 nurse practitioners that work in different modalities. Um, we have some in primary care, some in mental health, and we even have some that do kind of um, a help me out, is it energy. energy healing work, I'm sorry. Um, we even have a nurse practitioner that does that in the clinic. We also have psychiatrists, physicians, we have LCSWs, case managers, a whole variety of multi multidisciplinary staff. Um, we provide pretty comprehensive primary care, mental health, substance abuse, complementary care, case management services, and HIV counseling and testing within our clinic. Um, we use a very integrated approach. We started off as a primary care clinic, which kind of integrated mental health services, but like I said earlier, over time we saw that there was a much more 
pressing need for people to be able to access dedicated mental health services. So it eventually grew into its own separate department within the clinic, but at the same time, we're co-located. Um, so it's not uncommon for a client to present in primary care and have a mental health issue um, and have them run across the hall to consult with us or vice versa, someone comes in for a mental health visit and they have a seriously high blood pressure, well then we can take them right across the hall and get that concern addressed. Um, one of the things that's unique about Glide um, is the fact that we are affiliated with the church and so we also have access to the pastoral care department. Um, and there are times where clients present in a crisis and they do ask to speak with someone to address their spiritual concerns. And so we're able to pick up the phone and call someone and usually they come up within five to 10 minutes or so. So that is a unique service that we do have access to. Um, and some of the other providers will talk a little bit more about that throughout the course of the presentation. Um, the approach that we use, and I think it's just by virtue of us starting off as a nurse managed clinic, as nurses kind of think about things a little bit differently. We're always taught to kind of really check out what's going on with the client. And so as part of our assessment, um, years ago we developed a pretty comprehensive biopsychosocial assessment tool. And it does actually ask questions on there about one's spirituality. Um, because we recognize a lot of times for someone that's living on the streets or they don't have much, spirituality is what's keeping them going. It's what's there. And so we do like to take time to kind of ask people if they have any spiritual concerns. And if so, we try to find a way that we can help them to get connected either with the congregation at Glide or if they're a different religion or have a different background. We do try to take the time and see if there's somewhere where we can link them so that they can have that part of their life fulfilled. Um, the approach that we use is very patient-centered. A lot of our care is really driven by what the patient says. It's kind of different that you would come in, sometimes you go to your doctor's appointments and you lay out what your issues are and they tell you, okay, this is what you're gonna do. We don't take that approach at Glide. We kind of see what it is, what is the most important thing that the client would like to work on and we take it from there. And so we really have the client involved in the services that they receive. Um, and as far as directing that care, there's, there are times where we give people recommendations. They ask us, what do you think I should do? And we give them recommendations and that might not necessarily be the thing that they feel is important. They might not want to work on that as the priority. And so we kind of give them that advice, but we kind of really do let them guide the care because otherwise you end up with a client who already is in a pretty power, feels like they're in a powerless situation. You come in to us and we're kind of continuing to portray that and you have someone that just kind of slinks out of services because they feel like they're not in control. So we like to as much as possible empower the client so that they can feel like they're getting the most out of the experience and that their needs are being met. Um, we incorporate the glot, the whole Glide Foundation, we have a set of values, and there's a list of about 10 values, but at the core of the values is, is that there's a sense of unconditional acceptance, unconditional love, and so that's also woven in to how we provide services at the clinic. Um, our door is open, people come in, and it's like Reverend Williams was saying earlier, we don't care how people look, we don't care how they smell, we don't care what affliction it is that they're coming in with, everyone is welcome to come to the clinic and receive the services that we provide. And, just over, and then lastly, what I'll say, and I'm being a little brief because I'm a little bit under the weather, um, our main goal is that we create an environment where people feel welcome and where they feel comfortable with sharing anything with us because it's only through doing that that we can really get to the core of what it is that a client needs and find out ways that we can better serve them. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Tarver, who will talk a little bit about his experience of providing psychiatry in a faith-based environment. Thank you, SKD, and thank you all for being here. 
I'm going to present a little case, actually, and uh, it's not by any means meant to be the best case example. It's just a singular one uh, that I thought reflected on some of how uh, we attempt to address uh, spirituality or religion in concert with um, sort of uh, psychiatric, and in this case, psychotherapeutic practices. So uh, this individual, who I'll call Fred, which is not his real name, has given me permission to uh, speak with you all today. Uh, he is a single Christian bisexual white male in his 30s, and he first came to Glide Health Services in 2007 for general health care. Two years ago, he'd been referred for health services as a homeless individual residing at a substance abuse treatment center. Over the course of the primary care evaluation at Glide Health Services, as Eskardi has said, he was routinely screened for, screened for depression and uh, subsequently had a positive screen for depression and was referred to mental health assessment. And we confirmed diagnoses of major depression, generalized anxiety disorder, in addition to the already substantiated substance use disorders of alcohol and, co and cocaine dependence. For his mood disorders, the client was prescribed an antidepressant medication and sleeping aid, as well as psychotherapy. Uh, his sadness and anxiety symptoms responded well to psychiatric medication and therapy, and he progressed through a series of residential substance abuse programs and began to seek employment. Along the way, it was clear that his issues didn't only involve psychological and addiction-related problems, and that he had a crisis of faith of himself and in the world around him. I came to recognize that a conflict between his religious identity as a devout Christian and aspects of his substance use, as well as of sexual behaviors, had to be addressed in every planning aspect of his mental health care and substance abuse and occupational recovery. His lifetime clinical history had involved uh, much difficulty coping with his parents' acrimonious divorce at an early age, suffering a career-ending athletic injury after showing much uh, athletic pro uh, prowess in high school and college, several failed romantic relationships, and intense shame over feeling unworthy in the eyes of God and as defined by his Catholic faith. His addiction to alcohol and cocaine led him to dropping out from a prominent Jesuit college, estrangement from his family and friends, loss of employment, and a questioning of the Catholic principles of faith. Because my work at the Glide Health Center is influenced and informed by involving clients' spiritual selves in their treatment, I proceeded to treat him with a bit of therapeutic invention. That is to say that I dared to directly and persistently raise the subject of his spirituality and religion throughout the course of his psychotherapy. I now see him in an individual uh, program in a private practice sponsored by the city and county of San Francisco. Fred expressed that he derived much strength and solace from prayer, attending Sunday church services, pastoral counseling from a local bishop. He achieved abstinence from alcohol and cocaine for two years, transitioned from residential substance abuse treatment into independent community living, and sought and obtained employment at a Christian faith-based charitable organization. This faith-based workplace remains his most stable employment to date and his religious identity is so encouraged that it's at the forefront of his relationship to his colleagues and the clients whom they serve. Uh, he's given permission at this workplace, even encouraged and endorsed by his bosses to share his own personal recovery story with donors and clients of the agency. Through this course of events in the client's life, I kept setting aside my own beliefs as an atheist, uh, yet spiritually minded person. I say that I'm an atheist, but not an anti-theist, meaning that in other words, I fully respect the religious beliefs of my colleagues and clients, whatever they may believe in practice, and I actively practice psychiatry with a faith-informed approach. Questions that I routinely ask, as with this individual, are, what are the roots of your religious faith or spiritual beliefs? What do I need to know about your religious or spiritual beliefs and practices to help me understand you better? And this inquiry has been especially useful when working with individuals and in spiritual practices with which I am least familiar. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses, Wiccans, Pagans, uh, Muslim women in traditional um, 
veils who have presented at various sites such as Glide. I've also asked, what do you like or dislike about the ways in which spirituality were involved in your life in the past? How do you imagine your spirituality helping you now? What have you been told by members of your spiritual congregation or spiritual readings about the kinds of behavioral issues that trouble you? And lastly, are you aware that pastoral counseling or spiritual guidance are available options to help support you, your behavioral health recovery? And also, as Esker D. mentioned, uh, we're fortunate for being uh, a part of uh, GLIDE that we have pastoral counseling available quite readily to individuals. But if it's a faith or practice outside of uh, Christian faith, uh, we sh are sure to engage uh, the challenges of finding individuals that can be of support. And often individuals are very relieved that that's even brought up or mentioned and may either have some ideas of their own about where to go or can utilize our own uh, referrals uh, to that kind of support. Most recently, the client that I've called Fred has suffered a relapse of alcohol and cocaine use. Binging through a week of booze, drugs, and sex, he failed to report to work and misused company equipment. Simultaneously, he spent an entire paycheck at one strip club where the management and staff induced him to spend increasing amounts of, of money for services while he was fairly intoxicated and hence fairly incapacitated. Uh, this, uh, not surprisingly, induced a great deal of shame uh, and sense of worthlessness and failure for him. He has since enrolled in a 14-day outpatient substance abuse day program paid for by his employer-sponsored private insurance. He's reconnecting with his AA sponsor and has a new AA home meeting. He's beginning consultation with an assigned spiritual advisor at his faith-based workplace as a condition of employment while on probation. In our therapy session last Friday, I raised the issue of Fred's lapsed religious practices as one of the elements that likely contributed to this latest alcohol and drug relapse. He had not been considering his formerly supportive spiritual practices as important to returning to work and uh, to his ongoing addiction recovery. But I reminded him that his earlier lengthy two-year and uh, successful abstinence had been accompanied, even informed, by his spiritual practices such as relating to a higher power at AA meetings, scripture reading, solitary prayer visiting a church nearby his workplace almost every workday, and attendance at regular Sunday services. Accordingly, Fred recognized that he had avoided making a priority of nurturing his religious self due to recriminations against God and for allowing, for recriminations against God for allowing his relapse and shame or having disappointed God himself. We view this in the context of a misplaced perfectionism and narcissism that if it continued might lead to further risk of resorting to alcohol and cocaine if he indulged those painful feelings and ego dystonic feelings. Instead, I was able to steer him towards a more realistic, compassionate regard for himself and his human fallibilities. We, un we discovered that he'd had in fact been neglecting his religious practices for months preceding his relapse and that he generally benefited from such practices. Accordingly, he recommitted to a resumption of Sunday church services, choosing a newer and more recovery-oriented congregation over a previous congregation that he'd come to view as too chastising and too judgmental. Moreover, he was inclined to seek pastoral counseling toward reconciling his sexual self with his conflicted religious concepts of chastity, morality, and his spiritual self. So in conclusion, um, in presenting this case vignette, this is all to say that there is a role in professional therapy for explicit engagement with clients such as Fred. Clients whose spirituality or religiosity helps them to overcome their depressive feelings of worthlessness. worthlessness. Clients whose spirituality or religiosity forms the basis of their Alcoholics Anonymous or other substance abuse recovery work. Clients whose spirituality or religiosity is so much a part of their personal identity and career life development. Thank you. Hello, 
I'm Kathy O'Brien. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I've been at Glide about six years. I'm going to talk a little bit about the definition of spirituality and the history of mental health and the integration of spirituality that I see working at Glide. Um, for me, spirituality is that life force that connects the individual with the larger whole. Jack Kornfield has done a lot of reading, and maybe some of you have read some of his books. But he says, we can't stop the waves, but we can learn to surf. I think Glide is very proactive in helping people learn to surf. I think that their mission in serving the homeless has been to look directly at what their needs are and what their challenges are, and as I'm sure you know, there are many. I have found that each individual's path is a little bit different. We have the church as kind of the cornerstone of our foundation. People come and ask if they have to be a member of that church to come to Glide to receive um, care. They don't. Um, it's totally up to them. It's available to them, as all, all of our programs pretty much are. So besides the organized religion, others come and use meditation. Um, others connect with nature. Some people are so isolated, they feel like they don't connect at all. Jack Kornfield said, why spiritual practice requires that we actively address the pain and conflict of our life in order to come to inner integration and harmony. Spiritual life is not a process of seeking or gaining some extraordinary condition or special powers. In beginning a genuine spiritual journey, we have to stay much closer to home, to focus directly on what is right here in front of us, to make sure that our path is connected with our deepest love. You've heard us talk about unconditional acceptance, and for me, that's the cornerstone of what we do. Everyone is welcome to come to Glide, and I think we have one of the most non-judgmental practices that I've worked in. 90% of our clients are duly diagnosed with mental health issues and addiction. Glide's spirituality, to me, is its practice of unconditional acceptance coupled with medical care, mental health care, complementary care, meals, housing assistance, and through all of this, we connect the individual to a larger, hopefully helpful world to begin to lift their spirits. And I think it's a lifting of the spirits that allows the internal process to have room for spirituality to grow. Because I think a lot of our people come to us so downtrodden and feeling very hopeless. And I think that our staff and its receptivity to wherever they are is a great help in letting people connect and come and see Glide as helpful. I began my training over 30 years ago, and in the mid-70s, it was totally steeped in psychodynamic understanding. It was Freudian, um, the interest like e events of the id, the ego, the superego. It was plumbing the unconscious as the road to recovery and to change, and I think um, we certainly began to understand that that wasn't enough. Briefer therapies came in the mid-70s, uh, shorter-term interventions, cognitive behavioral therapy grew in popularity. They integrated mindfulness and relaxation techniques, which clients found very helpful when they confronted obsessive disorders, panic disorders, phobias, agoraphobia, um, as another channel to, to integrate the care and to release themselves from the anxieties that were binding them. So I think as we got a little more in depth and maybe a little smarter and practiced, we understood that it wasn't just the individual alone that we needed to treat. And family therapy grew in popularity and informed a lot of our practice, as well as couples therapy. In the recovery addiction, Al-Anon developed to help spouses and significant others. And then the ACA movement, the adult children of the alcoholics in the early, late 80s, early 90s, became very, very popular. And that recognition of how we treat people in relationship was very, very important. Now I see that we have much more structure built into our systems. I do some inpatient work as well as outpatient work and the biopsychosocial spiritual intake assessments include spirituality. We ask people how they soothe themselves, where their connections are to a larger world, and I think those queries are very, very important. At Glide, I think 
we offer the opportunity for that broader connection, but we don't make that a condition of the work that we do. I think that's probably the most important thing that we do, is that we leave the door open and it's an individual's choice. Some people just come for mental health, some people come for primary care. What we know about our population is that people who come to mental health may not have had any primary care for years. So along with a screening for depression, we also screen for diabetes and high blood pressure. We start the basics rolling so that if we can identify problems, um, we can certainly leave that door open so that they can get care. I had a patient who was living in one of the SROs in the Tenderloin, and a friend of hers brought her in because she was so depressed. And our medical assistant took her blood pressure and came to me and said, I've never had a blood pressure come out this low. I didn't know what it meant, but I knew it meant something. That's not my area of expertise, but immediately our clinic manager, Karen Hill, came in. She knew that it was internal bleeding and that this woman wasn't just depressed. And we got her to an emergency room. I think those are the things that we do that open the door and let us know that we really want to treat the whole person. Every person who comes to primary care is also given a depression screen. They're given it a second time in three months and three months again so that we have some measure of how people are doing. A lot of people don't even know that they're depressed. It helps us in mental health educate primary care just as primary care educates us every day about health conditions. So having all of this under one roof is a great aid. It's in the forefront of what clinics are now doing and I think that we're very fortunate to have that at Glide. Along with that, we have shelter reservations, we have case managers who help with clothing, they help with resumes, they help with food, they help with housing, food, furniture, um, wherever that person is, we try to intervene and, and see what we can do. Glide has spirituality at the heart of its existence by embracing and welcoming all individuals by providing meals, clothing, health care, pastoral care, counseling, and case management. They invite the individual to begin helpful and nourishing connections to a larger whole. I do think that Glide is known as a religious organization, and I can't emphasize enough that the foundation, that's only one program, and it's certainly an important one. But that is not a requirement. And I had a, a patient that I will close with who came to San Francisco from New York. He had been seriously addicted to alcohol, heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamines. He was in his early 50s. He was able to stop drug abuse on his own. He was transferred to me when a colleague left, and he would come into my office for every meeting, absolutely on time, carrying a bag with two open wine bottles. He asked that he never have an appointment later than 11 o'clock because he didn't want to disrespect our work and um, he didn't think he could go past noon without a drink. So that's what we did. We had 10 or 11 o'clock appointments. Um, I met with him regularly. He was able to be housed in an SRO. Uh, he was on general assistance. He was pretty much not interested in not drinking. He believed that his regime of herbs and vitamins was sufficient to offset the drinking. We practice harm reduction at Glide. That's certainly his choice. Uh, Dr. Tarver and I com helped him complete social security applications. He was very, very grateful when he finally got it. It was about his third or fourth application process. And if you don't know, it can be a very lengthy process. But it wound up with actually their offices calling Dr. Tarver and uh, asking him, is, can this man really work? Does he, is he really eligible? And Donald assuring them that indeed he was. He was a very bright man. He was a voracious reader. Many of our sessions we talked about politics. Um, and once he began to write, it was something he always wanted to do, and he brought his writing to me, and I was very, very impressed. Um, and at the end of our work together, he brought me his published uh, short stories. And I think for him, that was his spirituality, and I think that we at Glide were a part of it. Thank you.
to my right, you are looking at some of the most passionate, thoughtful healers that you will ever find in the urban experience. It has been my great and glorious privilege and honor to serve with them, and they truly, truly inspire me. When I first arrived at Glide, I was introduced to a client that I do not believe that I will ever forget. He stood about six feet tall with long stringy hair. His blue jeans were so cake stiff with dirt. His t-shirt was so soiled that you could no longer see the Grateful Dead emblem on his chest. But what I remember most about him was the stench. You see, this man whom I refer to as Mike lived in an unregistered Ford Ecoline van. He shared these humble quarters with a family of cats. Month after month, the van was not cleaned out, nor was it washed out. Mike slept among the droppings and the urine, and if his makeshift bed wasn't bizarre enough, Mike confessed to me that he had not had a shower or a bath in the last month. He was so fragrant that if the United States Department of Defense could have figured out how to bottle up the aroma, they could have sent it overseas as a war weapon. And this was just the beginning of the issues that Mike presented. I don't have the clinical background that would allow me to quote a diagnosis from the DSM-4 book, but I can tell you that Mike was angry, that he was impatient, that he was given to temper tantrums, and 10 minutes after he had hit the front door, he was seated in front of my desk. On his second visit to the clinic, Mike had calmed down somewhat. And without being pressed, he expressed to me a profound sense of loss due to the death of his only friend. And then he said, I love God. I love Jesus. He began to speak of faith that had sustained him and yet had somehow disappointed him in the time of heartbreak. And then he said, I'm lonely. Well, religion is more practical than most people make it, so I said to him simply, friend, you want and you deserve the communion and fellowship of fellow human beings. And if you desire this, you will not get it until you improve your personal hygiene. He nodded and he took a list of free shower locations from my hand. I didn't see Mike again for about two weeks. One day I walked into the client weight area and a neatly dressed man with a well-coughed ponytail said, Hi, remember me? The only thing that I recognized about Mike was his voice. The transformation was startling. Spirituality was so ingrained in this man's life that, that it would have been difficult to assist him with anything without first addressing or speaking about his spiritual needs. Glide is located in a very difficult area. The Tenderloin is a multicultural ghetto, a meth and crack saturated section of the city where law and order have broken down and the most vulnerable members of our society suffer from poverty, want, mental illness, and lovelessness. When I first came to Glide, the thing that most impressed me was the spirituality of the homeless. People began and ended interactions with the phrase, God bless you. Clients assured me that they were praying for me. In between queries about housing, about uh, food sources, about ways to find employment, uh, in between queries about can you help me with my resume or how do I escape from a domestic violence situation, they would share with me quotations of faith. They would share verses from the Bible, and occasionally some would say, can we pray? I now work with Glide's Youth Build Program, a school that serves highly at-risk young people from the hardest and most dangerous neighborhoods in the Bay Area. On my first day of work, I was standing in front of the building when my coworker looked at a car that was approaching us. Out stepped a young man with a scowl on his face, and my coworker said, He's a hardcore gangbanger, and he mentioned the name of the criminal organization that he believed that this young man was affiliated with. I gulped when I considered that this young man would be my client. A strange thing happened even before I was introduced to the young man. The client discovered that I was a, a person of faith. Somehow I don't advertise that at work. After he discovered this, he would never pass me without a Kool-Aid smile, a handshake, and the words, God bless you. 
again, we, one day we were in a, in a gym even before we had actually been formally introduced. And he walked up to me and he began to tell me that how he was embracing faith now and he was trying to leave a difficult background behind him with the help of the Lord. We can say that spirituality has no place in the workplace, but that is not true. It's not practical. Most of our clients, especially African American and Latino people, come from some type of a faith-based background. And, and so do our service providers. Now you might not bring prayer beads to the workplace, you, not, I mean, you might not bring anointing oil or have the 23rd Psalm plastered on your wall, but if you work in the inner city and you're a person of faith, who here hasn't uttered a silent prayer when they discover a strange bruise on the, on the torso of a vulnerable woman? Who hasn't bowed their head when they realize that a, a client that they work with and love has a, has a dropping T-cell count? We bring who we are to the workplace. When I first came to Glide, there was some concern about how much of my spirituality would actually be coming into the workplace. You see, I have an earned Master of Divinity degree from a seminary school, and I'm also a staff, an, an associate minister at the Allen Temple Baptist Church here in Oakland, California. People wondered, and they wondered out loud, whether I would be baptizing people, serving communion, and passing an offering basket during the client interactions. Well, perhaps Jesus' most famous parable concerned a Samaritan who was walking down a desolate road when he came across an unconscious victim of a mugging. The Samaritan stopped on his path. He administered medical care. He shared his resources with the man. He expressed a divine love and compassion to the fallen man, all without uttering a single word. And then Jesus bids us to do likewise. One day I walked into my case management office and I had an appointment with a man who was a Buddhist monk dressed in his robes. He owed a lot of money to the healthcare system and he needed someone to help him negotiate these thousands and thousands of dollars into a point where he would be able to, to live with a payment. Well, he walked in with two followers and he sat down across from me and I looked at the client and I said, what shall I call you? And one of his followers said to me quite gently, you shall not call him anything. They said, we will speak for him. They would not permit me to speak to him directly. And the monk looked at me and he smiled as though a lesson was being presented to me. My spirituality joined with his and we, two members of the human family, came together at that moment to really help each other. No words needed to be spoken. Spirituality is love in action and that is the Glide motto. It is on. Okay. Hi. I'm Vicki Smith. I'm one of the nurse practitioners at Glide. I've been there about nine years. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our recovery program. I think it's actually quite unique. I've worked in many recovery programs over the years. And this does add an element that you often don't see in other recovery efforts. Um, at Glide, spirituality is really a euphemism for social justice, and I think it's really embedded into all of our programs, including our recovery program. We recognize that the population that we serve, um, as Harry described, usually come to us with, besides substance abuse issues, mental health issues, physical health issues, there's this other element that they bring, that um, they're really impacted by poverty, by discrimination, um, homelessness, and you know we understand that this is very much linked to all of those issues, including their their recovery um, issues. So it's very much embedded into that program as well, which I think is a little bit different than more traditional recovery. Um, back in the 1980s when the crack epidemic um, hit, it differentially affected African Americans and uh, traditional 12-step programs didn't seem to be meeting the need of the population, in the, especially in the Tenderloin. And the leadership of Glide 
developed its own unique recovery program. And a couple of the things that were unique about it is they developed sort of an alternative to 12-step, which they called the recovery circles. And along with um, the people in the community who were affected by substance abuse and the staff, they came up with kind of this alternative approach. And I just want to read you the Glide's Terms of Faith and Resistance because this still underscores our recovery program today. Um, gain control over my life. And you don't, I actually brought copies so people, you don't have to write it down, but I, um, you can have a copy of this. Tell the world my story. And I think that's really important because isolation and hiding and not being able to express that this is going on in your life is, is really a hallmark of addiction. Stop lying, be honest with myself, accept who I am, and you know, Glide is really a beacon for people that are not accepted anywhere else. Feel my real feelings. Um, another place I think where, where Glide is unusual is, is some of the panel members have spoken about things that I think people would find very difficult to express in other venues, but at Glide, there really is, I think, an openness for people to be able to say whatever it is they want or need to say. Feel my pain, forgive myself, and forgive others. Practice rebirth, a new life. Live my spirituality, and again, it, it doesn't say religion, it says spirituality, so it really, even in a religious organization, leaves that very much open to interpretation. Support and love my brothers and sisters. One of the reasons this came about at that time, living in the Tenderloin was and continues to be an extremely dangerous place to live. And people felt that they really couldn't even leave their places that they lived um, to commune with each other and provide support. Glide kind of served as this beacon, and so it was the one place where people found a support system that they really didn't have anywhere else. And when I think about the spirituality aspect at Glide, I think the common denominator was really people, people feeling very lost, and this kind of gave people a place to express how they feel and have, a, again, a support system that didn't seem available to them anywhere else. The other um, activity that happened along with the recovery circles was something called Live at Five. And this was an open mic that happened in the evening and people from all over the community could stand up, take the mic, talk about whatever they wanted to. Most of this was about substance abuse, it was about crime, poverty, racism, all kinds of issues going on in their lives. And today this, this still exists. Um, it's called the Speak Out now, but we still, every Wednesday night at five, the community comes and takes the mic. People sometimes read poetry. People talk about all kinds of things that I, I think are difficult to be able to talk about in other venues. Um, we have um, a 90-day outpatient recovery program that opened in January. And we, again, include um, all of these kind of belief systems into our recovery program. We also have tried to include evidence-based practices. So we really want everything to be available to people that walk in there. So part of our intake process is to have a physical exam, a psychiatric evaluation, um, in addition to a substance abuse evaluation, all of our patients, regardless of what program they're in, are routinely screened for substance abuse, tobacco dependence, and mental health issues. Um, so as Esker D talked about, we have a very integrated practice. There's a lot of walking across hallways where, where people are seeing somebody for one reason and realizing really what's up for that person today is a substance abuse issue or a mental health issue. Um, or possibly they're there for a mental health issue and really, as somebody mentioned, their, their blood pressure is um, you know, through the roof. And so that's really the immediate need today. So we really have a great relationship and, um, among the staff and we just are kind of constantly walking people down the hallways to see another provider depending on what's going on for that day. In general, um, you know, 
recovery is often, or, or addiction is often thought of as a spiritual crisis. And what people are most um, familiar with is 12-step programs. And if you look at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Association, which is our, our national, our federal organization um, for substance abuse treatment, they also have a statement that they make about where spirituality fits into recovery in a more traditional way. I came with a bunch of handouts today. So this is a, another one, just this one page statement about that. And I think there's a lot of overlap between that and our sort of more non-traditional approach. Um, so one of the things, again, that I brought is our, our brochures that talk a little bit about our recovery program, what people get there, the different components. And I think I'll leave it there and give us time to ask questions or have a conversation. Thank you very much. So everybody, do we have some questions? I've got a microphone, I'll wander it around. I found your uh, description of the program to be really inspiring and um, one of the questions I had is that, um, is there a, um, a contradiction between unconditional love that's the foundation of what glide services are and confrontation if someone is in denial about a um, addiction issue um, that does, that is an issue that comes up sometimes but again excuse me like we said we use a harm reduction approach to services so we try and the reason we picked that approach is it's not as blaming it's not as shameful for someone in harm reduction who comes in and says you know I was clean for six months and then all of a sudden something tragic happened in their life and they went out and had a couple of drinks over the weekend and they come in and say you know what I'm I really messed up I don't I'm, you know, I'm this terrible person, I was doing so good, what happened? And we kind of reframe it into, okay, let's look at what happened and let's see how you can get back on track as opposed to some clients have come in and they've actually been participants in AA and they said, you know, I went and I talked to them and they made them seem like they were the smallest person in the world because they had this traumatic experience and they went out and had two drinks over the weekend and all of a sudden, no, you don't have six months, you have to start over from scratch. Um, so a lot of times there is a conflict. We try not to confront people so much. Sometimes it is necessary to tell a person, okay, look, you're say, laying all of this stuff out. Let me reflect upon you what it is that you're saying. Um, because the other thing in our community, a lot of people have been traumatized. And so we try to get away from the true confrontation telling somebody, you know, you're really not accepting what's going on. You're really not facing your issues because a lot of times they are very much aware of what the issue is, but that's the only way they've learned how to cope. And so in kind of confronting somebody and saying, no, this is what your real issue is, that's kind of seen as a way of breaking that person down. And so we kind of do that tread with caution. Um, if we see a situation where it's really the person is doing themselves some danger by not really kind of dealing with the issue, then yes, we do have to bring it to the forefront. But there is that conflict that exists. I'll just add that, you know, there really is no contradiction between unconditional love and confrontation. And I think this is one of the places where we've really been able to marry Glide's um, approach with evidence-based practice. Um, I think what unconditional love means at Glide is acceptance. So no matter who you are, what you bring, um, we're, we're accepting of who you are as a person. That doesn't always mean agreeing with people's behaviors, but we have a very, very low threshold for people to be able to come in and seek services, which is why so many people do. I think, like Esker D said, people think of confrontation as sitting on the hot seat and, and people sort of being yelled at and confronted. And as Esker D also said, um, you know, trauma is, is definitely one of the common threads that weaves itself through 
the people that we serve. And really, confrontation means a meeting. It means face to face. And so there's definitely a way to um, address people's denial and uh, to just reflect back to them sort of that difference between kind of what they're saying, what they're doing, uh, and so on. So I, I think, you know, you can do both and, and not have that be um, a contradiction at all. I just want to quickly uh, add that it's helpful, I think, as we work across diagnoses and non-diagnoses uh, to kind of depathologize because a substance abuse, I think, has been particularly overly stigmatized. Uh, and we talk about substance use management and harm reduction and the like in a non-judgmental accepting way and that I have to accept that I'm not in control of the other person's decisions, their values, uh, and their choices. Uh, one of the terms of faith and resistance is stop lying. Well, it's not my or uh, Reverend Williams or uh, Glide saying you're lying about something. It's the individual's perspective in terms of considering and walking around the room of are there ways in which they're being dishonest with <laughs> self and, and I would liken my approach to those who use substances that may be viewed by myself and most importantly by themselves as harmful as not too different than working with schizophrenics, uh, individuals who may have paranoid beliefs and there isn't the same expectation that I would confront their denial that these things can't be true. I can both hold that perspective and allow that for them, that's the truth of their lives that they're living and it may never change, it may be a fixed delusion, uh, but that we can be successful in serving the person who's there in terms of, well, what are your needs? Where are you getting into trouble with those people who are pursuing you or giving you negative feedback? And where can you live safely? Where can you eat uh, nutritiously? Uh, what can help you in terms of uh, feeling less agitated um, or combative? and finding the common ground that, that gets away from my uh, professional outcomes. Um, so my treatment planning, and I think for all of us, is really client informed. And uh, if we ever get a, too full of ourselves, as uh, Reverend Williams spoke, the clients are sure to correct us because they will either leave and or uh, confront us about how we're seeking to uh, control them it's not our role. My name is Eugenia, and I work at Mental Health Consumer Concerns as a specialist uh, facilitator. Therefore, I do groups. And when we talk about the issue of religion, sometimes I have to be very careful, and I don't, sometimes it's difficult when you stop and when you don't, because I noticed that many people, because of lack of edu education or beliefs that they have cliches, turn religion into almost an obsessive thing. I, have, I see criminals that have sold themselves the, the mother of God on, on themselves in, in their, in their uh, how you say this, in your own meat, you know? In, I see them then proclaim that they are religious and this and that. Um, there is a philosophical point of view for me. I am not, I come from Europe, a very religious country, but I don't want to impose my religion's beliefs because I don't want anybody to do the same thing to me. So I am more from the philosophical point of view, which is when you talk to a higher power. What I do with them is I try to explain to them very well what is what it means, higher power, and how can you use that as a tool for yourself, for your depression. When you're depressed, you are by yourself. Even if you go to the, to the war sea and stay there in the psychiatric war, you have to do the job. And spirituality helps tremendously with that. I noticed too that because of lack of spirituality, many people turn with a lot of hate and a lot of anger very much. So I think that I am all for helping out more 
to understand, for people to understand what really means higher power, what really means be, understand what it means to go certain paths, certain way without becoming uh, too obsessive with it. But there is a little bit in between and I would like to hear your opinions. Thank you. I, I just want to make a, I just want to um, comment on something you said earlier, and it kind of drew me back to what the first questioner said, uh, that she, when she asked about, the, when she mentioned the fact um, about confronting people when there is something that they really need to fix, and it may be uncomfortable, and, and I want to just tie that to what you just said about people covering up some of their deep-rooted issues with spirituality and with, um, with the falseness of, of their faith. And I believe that sometimes um, spirituality calls us to really be upfront and, and to uh, put things on the table. And people that are coming out of incarceration and people that are coming out of the streets don't understand the nuances of polite conversation. So sometimes you have to be very, very blunt. And I can't count the amount of times that um, we, I've told people, people have told me that we need to keep it real and, and are welcomed someone just being upfront and personal about us. Uh, about their issues and not brought healing to them. Um, I would just add that I think this is a process and um, it can be an incredibly long process and hopefully that over time um, people will be able to develop maybe a greater repertoire of things that they can, I mean ways that they can cope and and, and, and other things so that there's not just, you know, one thing that, that they go to. Um, my only goal when I see people is, is to try and convince them to come back one more time and then that next time will you come back one more time. And I, I think really having that patience and that ability to sit with it, even if, if it feels uncomfortable to me, or I disagree with it, and, and that's hard. You know, I'm very opinionated, so it's hard for me to sometimes sit there when people are expressing a view that seems very contradictory to how they're behaving, or possibly that it's maybe a little bit of a shield that, that they hide behind. So I tend to think of spirituality as, as a sense of connection, of a sense of, of, of a belief system, something a little bit outside someone's self. In terms of addiction, people often get very isolated, very self-centered. They really lose all those connections. And so that may be a very important one for them to have, but you know, to be able to sit there and, and, just, and just kind of wait and, and keep working with them. My thought about what you were saying is it is the group where the spirituality and the potential for spirituality resides. And by the continual inviting an individual into the group and to share their process is the opening that can happen for spirituality. Are you Hello, um, I'm a consumer and I wanted to know if Glide offers either pastoral care that's peer oriented or peer counseling. If you don't, do you have a vision for that in the future? So we do have a pastoral care department. Um, you know, I'm not all the way familiar with who's staff. I know there are certain staff there, there are volunteers. Um, there are also some groups that take place where they are actually peer-led, but the majority of the groups that are at Glide, we pretty much provide the space for the groups. We do a little bit of facilitation, but the majority of the group process is what the participants bring to it. 
Um, and so a lot, in, in some of the groups, I know we have a women's center, they actually open and close the groups with something spiritual, whether it be like a, a reading from something or whether it's singing a gospel song. But it's pretty much, it's very peer driven, the services that we provide. We may be saying, okay, this is the, the 12 o'clock recovery circle, but if the people participating in the group decide they don't even want to talk about substance use, they might be talking about whatever issues happen and oh, I found this new church and this is what you know. And a lot of times in the group, people's suggestion is, you know, somebody lays all this stuff out and I got beat up and this happened, they took my kids. A lot of times it will come up in the group, somebody will say, you need to go to church. A lot of people will say, you need to pray on it. So it comes up and we let the clients bring it up. Um, we haven't really, I don't know if anywhere else in the building, I know in the clinic we haven't necessarily Uh, in the community, I work with a lot of individuals, and many of them have mental health issues. Also, they go to see their therapist and their psychiatrist, but a lot of them do not have a primary care physician. So my question to you is, could they come to Glide? If they're a they're San Francisco definitely. resident. They're <laughs> definitely San Francisco residents. And because of the medication, many times it increases their blood pressure or causes them to be pre-diabetic. And I think some of those things could be prevented should they have a primary care physician to be on top of that. Thank you. And additionally, if these individuals happen to be, as I presume they may, uh, poor and in the community behavioral health services, they should be getting help now more than ever being linked out of their uh, psychiatric care and that doesn't always happen I work at a lot of different such places and some have primary care at the mental health clinic uh, but some others don't but it should be a commitment of the staff whether they're the psychiatrist the therapist the social worker case manager out of mental health to assist linkage to primary care uh, and if that doesn't happen, there are places for the individuals to go either directly to Glide or a number of other health clinics or to call the mental health access team <coughs> and they uh, can make those referrals. Uh, one of the places I've worked at for a while is in San Francisco, the major place where people new to behavioral health go, Westside Community Mental Health Center, the crisis clinic, and just newly they have a full-time staff person whose primary job is to get people enrolled in healthy SF if they're uninsured. Because of course, if they have Medi-Cal, they have other options. But if they're uninsured, healthy SF, even the mayor's budget for San Francisco announced today is not only gonna be preserved, but extended to cover uh, anyone uninsured for medical health services. Uh, but it isn't, the, the services are existent, it's not always efficient in, in a consistent message as to how to get linked. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Michelle, and I work with young people 16 to 24. And I wonder if you do any special programming, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I lost my voice, for young people, or if you recommend any spirituality practices, because I find <clears throat> that they are very interested, but they're not interested in organized religion, per se, but they are very spiritual. We do have a dedicated youth build program. Um, one of the things we started doing in the clinic was actually trying, and so the youth build program, they actually work with transitional age youth. Um, but one of the things we started doing was actually developing a youth clinic because we discovered that we have this subset of people that are getting services from a GLIDE program, but we found out they weren't really getting any health care. Um, so we have started trying to work with them on actually getting them to come into the clinic. We started a series of um, health-related classes with them. 
um, to try to get them kind of more informed about some health and men physical health, mental health issues, relationship type issues that exist. Um, as far as anything geared towards their spirituality, I know that there are some activities that take place at Glide. Um, they actually do have a youth ensemble that performs every so often. Um, and it seems like there's a pretty solid cohort of youth that attend the services and they have seemed to kind of form a network with each other. But I know Harry would probably have more information because he's transitioned from working with us at the clinic to actually being the case manager that works with the youth program. There, there really is a greater openness to, to um, spiritual matters among young people. And I think we've seen a resurgence of that through the hip hop generation. And, um, and there's uh, many of the young people, uh, the youth, Young people are often invited to come to Glide, and many are, are members there or attend at least sporadically. Uh, and they do, um, uh, they do have a greater sense of spirituality. And I think that's going to be something that will be addressed further in the, in the days to come. Thank you very much. We've got another question right here. Um, hi. Uh, my dad is a social worker, and he works with uh, people with uh, mental illness. Um, and he's always, uh, whenever like we would talk about his job, he was always would say, you know, be very careful about um, mixing spirituality uh, with um, like counseling or um, with the clients, um, because in his experience, he's um, had experienced um, some of his clients either turning to religion or spirituality, and them believing that they're cured um, and then uh, going off their medication that has helped stabilize them and then they would suffer a crisis. So you use the term um, recovery and so I'm just kind of wondering what you mean by recovery, particularly when there are some mental illness that really aren't, I guess, like curable, like schizophrenia or um, like bipolar um, disorder. So how would you like integrate um, spirituality, but also be very careful about like, okay, this is something that you're gonna have to work with for the rest of your life or something, so. I think it's a great question, first of all. And um, I, I'm sure other people will, you know, have um, some comments to make, but I think that's, you know, one of the great parts about our, our clinic is that we have, clinicians, we have case managers, we have volunteers, we have um, a variety of people that are involved in any particular client. So I think there's a series of checks and balances. Um, and I can just give you an example. Um, I had a patient who had a severe mental health disorder. He had a crack addiction. But what really knocked him off his feet was when he got diagnosed with colon cancer. And um, he was really declining, even though his level of functioning was something that required a lot of support just to keep him somewhat stable. And there was a point when sort of nothing was working um, that I asked him if he felt like it might be helpful to talk to one of our ministers, and he said yes. And called down to that department and one of our ministers was up there in two seconds and you know took him to another room and, and and spoke with i mean he was really having an existential crisis about you know a lot of life and death issues that somehow his substance abuse and his mental health issues had not really um, prompted him to think about at least in that way and when he came back into my office, you know, and I kind of asked him how it went, you know, he just, he, he just looked a little bit different. I mean, he felt like that was really helpful. And he actually participated more fully in his mental health care and, you know, for a time was taking his medication more consistently. So, you know, I sort of looked at it as all of us kind of working together to get the best outcome. I mean, we may have a very unique pastoral staff, I don't know, but they would never recommend that someone stop taking their medication or stop seeing 
their therapist or mental health provider and in fact support all of those. So, you know, I suppose it depends on, on where a person would go for services, but at least at Glide, um, I think all of those things work to provide the best outcome. It's not sort of an either or. Um, and in terms of your question about recovery, um, again, we're really informed by a harm reduction model, so it's really a process. It, it really is, you know, very much client dictated, what their interests are, what their goals are. Um, and and it really is a challenge to truly meet people where they are. I think our staff does a really great job, but um, that's really defined by the client. I just want to kind of add, because there's two things. A lot of times we look at recovery as far as it pertains to substance use, and then also how it pertains, as you were saying, to a mental health disorder. Um, a lot of times, I mean, and it's hard to gauge, it's very much driven by the person. Each person with the same diagnosis is not going to present the same. They may come in with a different level of functioning. So what I like to look at is, are we actually keeping the person engaged in services? Um, they may have resistance to taking meds. There may be times that they do really good with taking their meds consistently and then other times where they slip off. But even in those times where people are not taking their medications as they are supposed to, I always make sure to let them know that the door is open for them to come in. Um, I don't try to push the issue. Of course, I do education with them and let them know how important it is. But at the same time, they know that if they, for whatever reason, they decided that they didn't want to take meds for a time period, that they can still come in and check in. Um, and sometimes over time, they kind of see that things are getting a little difficult, getting a little shaky <coughs> with what they were trying to manage without the medications. And then that's kind of the opening to say, well, you know, you were doing really good for these few months. And what was going on then? I was taking my medication. And so sometimes we kind of work with people to kind of let them see what the difference is. But as far as integrating spirituality into that, as Vicki was saying and everyone else is saying, a lot of times we use it to kind of help the person kind of build their sense of strength. Um, we use it as a way for them to kind of, because a lot of times it's very hard. People have come to my office and broke down crying because they have bipolar disorder and why is this happening to me and what did I do? I don't deserve this. And it's a very difficult thing for somebody to realize that you have a disorder, it's not your fault that this is happening to you and that you're gonna to have to deal with it for your whole lifetime. So there has been times where clients have come in and the only thing that I could really think to do, um, there was a woman in particular who just came in and broke down crying and said, I prayed about it and it just won't go away. And, and she was so unconsolable. The only thing I could think to do was to take off my iPod and let her listen to some gospel music. <laughs> and she kind of, I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> so, and, and I mean, that kind of brought her to a place where she was able to be a little bit calmer and actually take in some of the information and kind of get recharged to be able to say, okay, I'm hearing what you're saying, I can deal with this and move forward. And so it really just, it really depends on the client with how we integrate the spirituality into their treatment. And if a spiritual approach is what is most helpful and most meaningful for the patient, you know, we don't want to get in the way of that happening for them. So, um, you know, it's, it's always within the realm of options and up to the person to, to sort of choose what is most helpful, meaningful for them and what combination of things. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. I think my question might have been answered, but I, um, I grew up in San Francisco, was born and raised there, and over the years I watched how, um, Reverend Cecil Williams has been so embracing of people and especially um, a, uh, a ministry that could reach the people with mental disabilities that were so misunderstood by a lot of society. I guess my question, and you may have answered it, is are there ministers maybe like yourself, Harry, or um, that when people just need the gospel of Jesus Christ, because I've 
found, we're ministers also, and we're kind of doing a similar work here on a smaller scale in Oakland. I found out that sometimes people just need that and they don't even know how to ask for it and they just need the gospel and the scriptures. And are, is that available in the counseling when they need that kind of, and I'm sure you can tell the ones who really are just pulling and really need that kind of breakthrough. The services that we provide a glide are client-based. So just as you said, the clients will present with an issue and we, we work around what they really what they really need, especially during case management. But at, at Glide, I serve as a case manager and not a minister, so that's kind of a, a fine line that I really do have to observe. But there are times when people will express that and I do uh, refer them to different places that, where they can receive the type of spirituality that, that they need. Um, it's difficult to work, uh, it's difficult to uh, Spirituality is so ingrained in people's lives and it's so intricately a part of their lives that it's hard to provide services to them without considering that. But I do have a line that I have to, to work with you know, and egg line. I just add as an aside because Harry is very humble and like he was saying, we were wondering what is the minister going to do in case management, but what we started noticing was some of our most belligerent clients, clients that people were scared of, they would get violently, get threatening when things didn't go their way. There was one particular client that went in yelling and screaming and Harry kind of said, well, do you want to come in and talk for a minute? And the guy's yelling and screaming and cursing and everybody's scared. And he came out of the office just as calm as he could be and looked at everybody and smiled and said, everybody have a nice day. And we were like, Harry, what did you do? And, it, <laughs> and so it's always been the great mystery. What is it? it the, spirit, the spirituality just kind of wafts off of Harry's body. It just perme permeates any room that he's in because people go in and it's not anything. We asked him, well, what did you guys do? What did you talk about? Oh, we just kind of talked about what it is that I needed. But it's something transformative that happens. So even though he says the fine line, it's, this, it's coming out of his pores because people come out transformed, a totally different person after they meet with Harry. And I just wanted to add that's <laughs> true. Thank you. We've got our last question right over here. Oh, well, it, it's a, a comment and then a very practical and very simple question. Um, first of all, I thoroughly enjoyed the panel discussion and I certainly think we have a lot to learn in terms of at least in my system, in terms of integrated practice. I was extremely impressed with what you had to say about integrating both the physical health care, the mental health care, the substance abuse, and the spirituality. Um, I'm also extremely impressed with the sensitivity of the staff and the diversity among the staff, from a minister to an atheist, and all in between. And yet there is that sensitivity and, and spiritual awareness. So that's the comment. My question, and you, one of you, I don't remember whom, indicated that you had developed a biopsychosocial tool that you use for assessment that has that kind of spirituality, sensitivity, and awareness built in. So my very practical question is, are you willing to share that? We're willing to steal from anybody. <laughs> you don't want to reinvent the wheel. That's not steal. a problem. If you'll tell us where to fax it, we can easily fax you a copy. Yeah. Great. Well, everybody, let's thank our marvelous panel for a 